The National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated stations present The Pacific Story. In the midst of the fury of world conflict, events in the Pacific are taking on even greater importance. Here is the story of the Pacific and its peoples, whose destiny is at stake in the Pacific War. Here is the tale of the war in the Pacific and its meaning to us and to the generations to come. The Pacific Story, presented by the National Broadcasting Company and dedicated to a fuller understanding of the vast Pacific Basin. This broadcast series comes to you as another public service the drama of the past and present of the millions of people who live around the world's greatest sea, where the East at last meets the West. Thailand, the enslavement of a free people. six centuries, Thailand prided itself on being the only independent nation in the Far East, the land of free men. Today, that freedom is gone. Thailand is allied with Japan against the United States and Britain. And the man who holds the whip hand over Thailand is the little Hitler, Luang Pibul Sangram. We are determined to get back our territory. We will get it back. Every effort will be made to achieve this end without force. But if force is inevitable, war will be waged with a minimum of bloodshed. Pibul Sawat means the same as Heil Pibul, which Luang Pibul Sangram has ordered said, the same as Heil Hitler is said in Germany. Luang Pibul rose from obscurity to a power in Thailand in the space of ten years went through many of the same steps as Hitler during this rise. In 1935, Luang Pibul stood before the mirror in his room, combing his hair. He called his personal servant. How might you go? Yes, Luang Pibul. You ate me my hat. Yes, Luang Pibul. What are you doing? Put down that pistol. Keep looking into the mirror. How might you go? Take that pistol away from my back. No, you cannot escape. You will not escape, Luang! You will not escape! Luang Pibul escaped his servant, but two more attempts were made to assassinate him. By forceful steps, he rose from the rank of major to colonel, then to the post of minister of defense. Like Hitler, he organized a youth movement that could effectively be used as Hitler used his brown-shirted stormtroopers. He became field marshal, then premier, the Fuhrer of the Thailand people. Luang Pibul has concentrated all the power of Thailand in the hands of the army and navy. You mean in his own hands? We still have a constitution. On paper only. Does our people's assembly mean nothing? The people's assembly knows better than to oppose the will of Luang Pibol. But what of our rights? We are free people. Shh. Hold your tongue. Luang Pibol has long ears. With Japan's encouragement, Luang Pibol defied and threatened the European powers in the Far East. As Hitler declared that all Aryans should be included in a greater Reich, so Luang Pibul declared, We must bring, under Siamese domination, not only the territories which Siam has been compelled to yield to France, but also those regions with populations of Thai race which are now subject to the control of Britain and China. This fellow is following Hitler's pattern exactly. Yes, he not only wants back the territory taken from Siam, but he wants a lot more. Mm, more than he's entitled to, if you ask me. Mm, nice idea. Claim all the territory that's inhabited by the population of the Thai race. The destiny of the Pan-Thai movement is to include all our people in one nation. We must extend the frontiers of the Siamese kingdom until this has been achieved. Hey, 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 Hey,
1939, Siam changed its name to Thailand. That same year, the war broke out in Europe. Luang Pibol declared that Thailand would remain neutral. In 1940, after the fall of France, Japan moved into French Indochina. Subsequently, Japan, pursuing her policy of courting Luang, made a gift of six states in Indochina, Burma, and Malaya to Thailand. Observers in the Far East saw the trend of events to come. Whatever happened to Luang's neutrality? Are you referring to his propaganda blasts against the United States and Britain? Yes. He went over to the Japanese camp quick. Well, he's not over there yet. He knows the people are not with him. Well, he's preparing them for the step he's going to make. You can be pretty sure of that. You have to remember that the Thailanders don't like the Japanese any more than we do. And a lot of them don't like Luang either. Well, I say watch him. He wouldn't be taking these propaganda pot shots at Britain and the United States just for fun. Something's in the wind. Something was in the wind. On December 8, 1941, the day after the attack on Pearl Harbor, waves of Japanese bombers swooped down on Bangkok, the capital of Siam. Japanese bombers are carrying out a raid in force on Bangkok. The city is being blasted with... Before daylight, and great numbers of troops are landing in Britain. Extra, extra! Thailand surrenders in five hours. Thailand surrenders to Japs in five hours. Read all about it. Thailand surrenders in five hours. Japan had played her cards well. The Wang people delivered Thailand to Japan, and with its conquest, the Japanese won a key position from which it was to drive southward to take all Malaya and Singapore and westward to take all of Burma. The people of Thailand, the land of free men, had lost their freedom. For six centuries, they had fought for it, guarded it against adventurers, repulsed invaders to preserve it. Their legends perpetuate the name of the fabulous hero who freed his people from the Khmers. His name was Phra Ruang. And he lived many, many years ago. Fra Ruang was a simple boy. He earned a living by cutting water from the springs at Laburi to Uncle Tom. But he carried so much water to the king in ordinary baskets that the people at the palace were afraid of him. They said there was something dangerous about one who could transport so much water. They watched him, and soon his friends told him that the king was about to seize him. Fra Ruang got away just in time. He ran away to the Sokotai Monastery, and there he meditated on the plight of his people. He talked to his fellow Thais and stirred them up against the king. A Khmer general with many soldiers came out to put down the unrest among the Thais. But Fra Ruang and another Thai chieftain defeated the Khmers. Fra Ruang won the freedom of the Thais. And so Fra Ruang became king of the Thai kingdom of Sokotai. <laughs> In the 1500s, the Portuguese came to the Far East. A hundred years later, Dutch ships and merchants began to visit them. Relations with European powers were established. We welcome you to Siam. This is the Siamese king, Akatatsarat. We regard your presence as an envoy of your country here in Siam as homage from your government. We are honored. We beg that you remain with us Long. Embassies were set up in Siam by the Portuguese and the Dutch. Soon the English came, and following them, the Japanese came in large numbers. And in the years to come, the United States was to learn something of the nature of dealing with Siamese royalty. I don't understand it, Smith. You are my interpreter. Why do the Siamese officials refuse to permit us to see the king? I, I don't know, Mr. Balestier. All he would say is that we could not see the king. Well, something was wrong. I could feel it. 
I interpreted everything you said just as you said it. We had our credentials? Yes, I had them right in this box in my hand. Don't they realize that I have come all the way across the Pacific from the United States to make this new trade treaty with them? Yes, yes, they understand it, Mr. Bell. Our dear, but... trade relations have always been pleasant. They... They signed the first treaty that the United States concluded with any Asiatic power just 17 years ago, and they knew that I was coming to conclude this treaty with them. Could it have been because they were not satisfied with the first treaty? No. Well, they themselves called the treaty that Edmund Roberts signed with them in 1833 a treaty of amity and commerce to last as long as heaven and earth shall endure. Yes? Mr. Ballestier, a gentleman is here to see you. Mr. Stewart Ridge. Stewart Ridge? Yes, he says it's about your visit to the palace today. Hmm, that's strange. Uh, well, send him in. Yes, sir. Smith, do you know anyone named Stewart Ridge? Uh, no. No, I don't think I do. Hmm, Stewart Ridge. Oh, uh, uh, perhaps he's that fellow from the British office here. Right in this way, Mr. Stewart Ridge. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Bolestier. I'm Alaric Stutridge from the British office. Oh, yes, yes. How do you do, uh, Mr. Smith? How do you do? How do you do, sir? Mr. Belostier, I understand you had some difficulty getting to see the king this morning. We did not see the king. And you had the same experience that James Brooke had recently under the same circumstances. The officials refused to uh, permit him to see the king? Yes. You had your credentials with you? Yes, yes, I had them. I had them right in this box in my hand. And I had an umbrella in the other hand. You didn't regard the Siamese as inferiors, did you? No. No, we were very careful about that point. I'm afraid that's what Sir James Brooke did. Unthinkingly, of course. Oh, yes, of course. But Sir James insisted on his title. Mm, that wasn't very tactful, Mr. Stewart Ridge. We sensed that later. But there must have been something more. We had a feeling that we offended them by our lack of respect. So that was the last thing we intended. Mm, that gives me a clue. Perhaps they were offended by our lack of ceremony in presenting our credentials. If you'll pardon my saying so, gentlemen, I'm afraid that's it. They intimated that Sir James' credentials were only from the Governor General of India and were dated two years before. Yes, but they were credentials, weren't they? Yeah, but the fact that they were not from the British King made them think that we did not regard the Siamese court of sufficient importance to bring credentials from the King. I see. They hold any document sent by the King in high reverence giving it the same honors as the king's person. I see. So uh, when Smith entered with our credentials in a box in one hand and an umbrella in the other, they must have felt that we did not regard our credentials very highly, and so they would not. Yes, and this explains why neither Britain nor the United States was able to negotiate a new treaty. <laughs> The coldness of the Siamese toward the foreigners was not to pass until a new king ascended to the throne of Siam, King Mongkut. Then, gradually, Siam was opened to foreign commerce, and Siamese ambassadors were sent to Europe for the first time since the 17th century. But Siam was not to make real progress toward nationhood until the coronation in 1873 of the young king Chulalongkorn. <laughs> from far and wide for the ceremony. Well, let's stop here. We'll be able to see here. Yes. The procession will come right by this point. It's like a great holiday. It is a great day. Such pageantry. I've never seen anything like it. All the years I've been here in Bangkok. Well, what are those men over there in those yellow robes? Oh, those are monks. They come from all the shrines here. Is every one of those gaily colored spires a shrine? Most of them. And uh, what are those... Uh... Those vertical signboards hanging in front of all those shops. Uh, those are signboards of Chinese merchants. Yes. There are many of them here. Such a crowd of people. Uh, what is that fellow over there? He's a boat dweller. Bangkok has a complicated network of canals. There are thousands and thousands of people like that man who spend nearly their entire lives on their boats. Is that so? Yes, indeed. And uh, the new king, Chalalongkorn, often stops and speaks to them on the streets or along the canals. Comes right out and mixes with his people? Yes. We've often seen him riding through the streets, stopping and chatting with people. I've heard he's a very colorful person. Well, he's traveled outside of Sam quite a good deal. Visited Singapore, Java, India. <laughs> that shocked many of the officials in his court, but it's had a great influence on his thinking. 
And it'll probably have a great influence on his future policy also. Oh, here come the elephants. Look at those elephants. How they're decked out. Yes. This is really the land of the white elephant. Look at the colors and those trappings. Such elegance. Good heavens. I've never seen such a procession of elephants. What's this coming? It looks like the royal palanquin. Well, let me see. It's sort of an elaborate litter with a fancy chair on it. More like a throne. And look at that golden umbrella over it. That looks like the new king in the throne, Kalalonko. There's three, six, nine. Why, there are 12 men carrying it. Yes, it's very heavy. Yes, that's the royal palanquin, all right. Good heavens, what splendor. The richness of that throne. And that umbrella must be real gold. It probably is. Is that really Chulalongkorn? Why, he's hardly more than a boy. That's Chulalongkorn, all right. He's just a young man, but a very bright one. He's the first Siamese king to say that his duty is to rule not for himself, but in the interests of his people. Oh, hello, Council. Did you see the king? I just saw him passing his palanquin, yes. Very impressive. Did you hear about his proclamation just after the coronation? Why, no, he didn't. He has abolished prostration in the royal presence and has abolished slavery. Abolished prostration? And abolished slavery? In Siam? Why, it's incredible. Counsel, that young king is going to be remembered for a good many centuries to come. Long Khan adopted a shrewd foreign policy. He saw that Siam could not stop the European powers if force were used, but that Siam could prevail as an independent nation if he played off two equal adversaries. Accordingly, he played off Britain against France. Britain held Burma on his west frontier. France held Indochina on his east frontier. But after the turn of the century, another rival rose to dispute Britain's influence in Siam. This was Germany. Germany made political advances, infiltrated Siam with commercial enterprises, and sought to get a foothold on one of the Gulf Islands. And then, in many American cities... Say, uh, that crowd of people over in front of the journal office... Yeah, something must have happened. Let's go over okay, there. Okay, let's. Hey, did you see that headline there? Why, it's Look, unbelievable. there's a bullet and pasted on the window. What does it say? Can you see it? Yeah, just see it. It says... Uh, a Japanese naval squadron under Admiral Togo has destroyed the Russian fleet in the Pacific. Huh? War has broken out between Russia and Japan. Well, that's blasted the Russian fleet. Sank a whole raft of our ships. The repercussions of the Russo-Japanese War shook the Far East. Japan emerged as a power in the Pacific and replaced Germany as Britain's chief rival in Siam. And more than this, Japan's victory had a far-reaching psychological effect on Siam. Ambitious Siamese said... The European nations are not invincible after all. No. There is no reason for Siam to be overawed by the European nations. We must take a bolder stand against the foreigners. Yes, Japan has shown the way. Yes, and by following Japan's example, Siam can retain her independence. The Siamese were right. Increasing attention was shown to Siam by the powers. In 1909, there was a great Austro-Hungarian celebration in Siam, and the Siamese received more attention than they had ever received since the first day a European set foot upon their soil. In the court of Siam... Who is that being presented to the king now? Shh. That is the French commander of the Indo-Chinese forces. And that was a British admiral who was presented just a minute ago. They say there's a Chinese delegation waiting to see the king. And the Prince Regent of Brunswick is here. Yes. Yeah. Didn't battleships in the harbor? Battleships? Yeah. There are three German warships and many Japanese and French cruisers and English ships. Then... Perhaps we are to keep our independence. Perhaps. But there are still rumors that Britain and France will someday partition Siam. The importance of Siam was beginning to emerge. But meantime, apprehension within Siam was growing. A new king, Rama VI, came to the throne in 1910. Discontent smoldered. A plot to kill the new king was discovered, and when World War I broke out, Siam became the focal point of pressure from both adversaries. Above all else, we must think of Siam. This is King Rama VI. just because France and England are involved. But as your ministers, your royal highness, we must advise you that France is exerting great pressure upon us from Indochina 
and Britain from Burma. We are squeezed between them. And there is another important factor, Your Highness. Speak. Both Britain and France are charging that Siam is the center of German intrigue, which they say is radiating throughout the entire Far East. That cannot be true. Germany is of far less importance to Siam than Britain and France. What do you mean by that? If Siam should join the Allies, we could then confiscate all German interests in Siam. And uh, perhaps get important treaty concessions at the peace table. But that would mean a declaration of war. Technically, yes. There is one other important consideration, Your Highness. Our indebtedness to England and France? England and France are now our allies. If Siam should not declare war on Germany, then England and France might move in on us from Indochina and Burma and set up a protectorate over us. You see, Your Highness, it might be a distinct advantage for Siam to declare war on Germany and take its side. Rama VI took Siam into World War I against Germany. And when the balance sheet was struck at the peace table, Rama's ministers were proved right. Siam saved herself from becoming a protectorate of England and France. She emerged from the conflict without having suffered a single military casualty and with no war debt whatever. Siam's importance on the Pacific scene was rising. Rama VI died in 1925, and young King Park ascended to the throne. Rajadipak, who had many such glittering titles as the brother of the moon, the half-brother of the sun, the possessor of the four and twenty golden umbrellas, came to the United States in 1931 for an eye operation. He had heard the rumblings for constitutional government in his own country before he left. And in the United States, he said, I am most interested in the practical workings of democracy. I want to see whether voting really expresses the will of the majority. I want to learn about the form of voting and how political campaigns are conducted. At home in Siam, the rumblings were growing louder. Rumors were rife. King Prashadipak is in favor of giving us a constitution, but the princes are against it. King Prashadipak has cut down on the number of civil service jobs, and that's why he has so many enemies. I heard that the ones in the civil service are organizing because all the key positions are held by princes. They say that certain elements of students and officials are organizing to make some sudden drastic change. The rumblings grew, but few people, not even the government, took them seriously. On June 24, 1932, King Prajadipak was away from the capital at Bangkok, enjoying himself at the seashore. Your Majesty. Your Majesty. What is it? Why are you so excited? This. This letter. You know what is in it? The one who brought it, King Prajadipak. He said he came as an agent of the People's Party and... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is the will of the People's Party that you remain on the throne of Siam as constitutional monarch. If your royal highness finds this impossible, then another king will be chosen from the royal family and placed on the throne in your stead. I... I have heard it whispered, Your Majesty. I was afraid. Your Majesty. Yes, General? King Prajadipak, the People's Party has taken possession of the throne hall and the throne hall square in Bangkok. Taken possession of the throne hall? Where is the chief of staff? He is touring the northern provinces, and the admiral of the navy is at sea. The People's Party timed it well. They are holding the princes of the Supreme Council in the throne hall, and they have issued this manifesto. These are demands of me? They say these are the principles of the People's Party. Hmm. The aims of the new regime shall be the maintenance of national independence, peace, public security, the improvement of economic conditions. The People's Government guarantees popular government for the people's welfare, education, and equal rights for all, and the abolition of the privileges of the princes. Oh, what do they wish of me now? That you accept 
this manifesto within one hour. One hour? The members of the royal family in Bangkok are in the hands of the People's Party. My family? The People's Party will hold them responsible for any countermeasures that might be taken. We shall accept. We have long favored a constitutional government. The next year, 1933, Luang Thibault rose through the welter of events of this land which was struggling to reconstitute itself. The Jadipok abdicated in 1935, and his nine-year-old nephew, Ananda Mahidol, was proclaimed king. The way was now open for Luang Thibault. We will fight to win back our lost territory. All the people of the entire race must be included in one nation. We will extend the frontiers of the Siamese kingdom until this has been achieved. With control of Thailand's armed forces, this little Hitler of the Far East took his nation into war on the side of the Japanese against the United States and Britain. With this act, the six centuries of Thai independence came to an end. The Thai people became unwilling collaborators of Japan. But in Washington, D.C., the Thailand minister to Washington has rejected the action of his government in accepting the terms of Japan and has organized a free Thai movement to express the voice of the enslaved people of Thailand. Today, with the tide of the war in the Pacific turning against Japan, Luang Thibault sits uneasy as the dictator of Thailand. The growing allied might looms like a menacing shadow over him. The land of free men is stirring in its own behalf. Luang Thibault himself has eloquently revealed the state of his security in his pronouncement. The enemy has tried his best to throw our country into confusion by instigating internal dissension, which, if we fall into his trap, will ruin our country. I beg you not to believe in enemy propaganda, nor in evil rumors. I want you to know that our country is confronting a precarious military, economic, and financial position. I have been reproached that my ministers are men of dishonorable character. Not only does the enemy hate me, but the Thai people hate me as well. Luang Thibault Sangram is learning that he who sips with the devil must have a long spoon. Neither he nor the Japanese have been able to crush the fierce love of independence of the Thai people. Both the Wang people and the Japanese are being undermined from within Thailand by the Thai people, and from outside by the growing free Thai movement, which has spread from Washington to London to New Delhi. And these factors, coupled with the strategic importance of Thailand, promise to make Thailand important in the coming operations in the war in the Pacific. have been listening to The Pacific Story, presented by the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations as a public service to clarify events in the Pacific and to make understandable the cross-currents of life in the Pacific Basin. A reprint of this Pacific Story program is available at the cost of 10 cents. Send 10 cents in stamps or coin to University of California Press, Berkeley, California. The address again... University of California Press, Berkeley, California. The Pacific Story is written and directed by Arnold Marquis. The original musical score was composed and conducted by Thomas Peluso. Your narrator, Gain Whitman. The program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs>